We're going Australia. to Australia! We have some really exciting news. We are going to Australia and we want to tell you kind of what's going on and what we'll be doing and why we're going. So I'll pass it over to Allison for a second because she is the main reason why we're going. And then I'll tell you guys about some plans we have and where we'll be going and what we'll be doing. Super exciting stuff. Yeah. Hi everybody. So I am finishing up my Masters of Occupational Therapy. And part of that, I have to do four seven-week placements. For one of those placements, there was an opportunity to do it internationally. Um, so they had various places that we could pick from. So one of them was Australia, there was Indonesia, Hong Kong, various places. But Johannes and I have been interested in going to Australia for quite some time now. So that really piqued my interest. So I signed up and it was basically a big lottery system with everybody in my class and there's like 120 something people in my class so funny enough I was the last person out of the lottery list to get picked and there was one place left and it was Perth Australia we were so, really uh, really nervous because we really really wanted the Australia placement and it wasn't confirmed for the longest time we were kind of waiting on the edge of our seats to see if she was gonna get it or not and then she got it got the good news. Yeah, so we still don't know too much yet. We're waiting on some more details, but we know that it's in Perth and it's a seven week placement. So it's from the end of September to the beginning of November. We'll be flying from Calgary. Um, that's where we live right now is Calgary, Canada. It's a great place to live. We really love it here and we love exploring and four wheel driving. It's the main reason we got into kind of what we do and why Australia is so appealing to us because it just seems like this uh, a, a mecca for all things uh, adventure, which is what we're really into. And uh, we were really fortunate that Allison had a, a, a school opportunity. We'll kind of be mixing in some of that stuff along the way. I think our plan is, is that we'll go to Australia a bit earlier than my placement. And maybe Johannes can tell you a bit more of that plan, but we'll go a bit before so that we have time to explore. Mm -hmm. We really want to explore some some places in Australia and I would like to ask some of you guys for some tips and uh, for some ideas on, on what we can do while we're there um, and that will segue us into the next portion which is uh, where are we going in Australia and some of our ideas that we would love to accomplish while we're there. All right Allison had to run to work it's just me she has a practicum or a placement and what that is when you're in school for healthcare, uh, like she is, she's doing her master's of occupational therapy. They'll do a bunch of in class learning and then they'll actually uh, be placed like in a hospital, for example, and she'll get to practice some of those real life skills that she would be doing day to day on the job, but she would be practicing them as a student just to get some real world experience. So that's what a placement is. So she got an international placement. So she's going to be practicing her skills, her occupational therapy skills that she learned here in Canada. She's going to be uh, practicing them in Australia as a student. So it's kind of, uh, kind of a cool thing that they can do international placements like that. Uh, so our plans while we're in Australia. We'll mainly be focusing on Allison and her school, but uh, there will be some time where she won't be in school. And during that time, we're gonna be doing some exploring. And we're very, very excited about that because Australia is huge. We've wanted to see it for so long. We've seen so many amazing photos, videos of, of you guys uh, over in Australia doing some really cool things. You have just inspired the heck out of us to want to come see uh, your country if you live there. So um, yeah, yeah, you, you really make us Canadians jealous with some of the things you guys get to do. So we're so excited to come and visit. Now, for times and dates, 
we are going to be coming over at the end of August. So we have to be in Perth while she's doing her schooling. So her placement is in September. Thinking about coming a little bit earlier, and here's where it gets really exciting. This is where my imagination starts to go a little wild about all the possibilities we can, we can do. What we would like to do is to buy a used four-wheel drive truck. Something on a budget, we are on a budget here, student budget, you know, but we'd like to do something Kind of, kind of fun. This is a, uh, this is is going to be a big trip for us. So I love Toyota. I love four wheel drive. I think what we're gonna do is buy a used kind of budget four wheel drive, something like a Hilux, an old Land Cruiser, something like that. Maybe a Prado. We're we're really going after simplicity and reliability. So something like the Hilux would just be perfect. So shout out to you guys. If you have a used four wheel drive that you'd like to sell us, get in contact with us because we are officially in the market for a used four wheel drive. If you guys got anything, any leads on any good deals, let us know. Hilux, Land Cruiser, Prado, that's what we're in the market for. That brings us to uh, my second point here is where I'd like to explore with this vehicle because Australia is a big place. And we want to see a lot of it. My idea here is to fly into Sydney a month early before Allison's practicum, purchase a used four wheel drive, kind of a budget build, drive it across the Australian bite to Perth. Really fantastic four wheel drive route. I've seen a lot and I've done a lot of research on the bite and Israelite Bay, you know, uh, the, the Nullarbor kind of places like that. We would just just lo absolutely love to see those. So that's kind of what we're thinking. And we are looking for some ideas and some tips on how we can get a trip like this done. I think it's going to be difficult and challenging at times, but I think it's going to be a very rewarding trip. If we don't have any, you know, mechanical dramas, breakdowns, nobody gets sick, anything like that, right? So I have a couple of questions for you guys here that I wanted to ask you because I don't know how some of these things work, especially when it comes to vehicles. Number one is registration. I uh, hear a lot about uh, registration on a vehicle in Australia. Not 100% sure on how that works actually. Do you pay month to month on registration? Do you buy a year's worth of registration? We only need to register the vehicle for about three months. Do I have to pay a whole year of registration? Um, how much does it cost? You know, if I'm buying uh, an 80 series or a Hilux, how much is something like that going to cost? If if there's already registration on a used vehicle and I purchase that vehicle, um, can that registration be transferred to me or do I have to go and buy registration? See, those are the kind of things that I am i don't know. Number two, uh, insurance. How do I purchase insurance? I don't know how that works because I won't have a fixed address in Australia. So can you purchase I know you can because I've seen other people do it, but basically how do you purchase registration and insurance without a fixed address in Australia? So if you can help me answer those questions, I would greatly appreciate it. Number three, I'm not keeping this vehicle forever. I only need it for three months. So can I sell it once I get to Perth? Because I'm gonna purchase it in Sydney, but I'd be able to sell the vehicle in a different state once we're done with it, right? Once our trip is over, we're heading home, we're flying home, I need to sell the vehicle, get rid of it really quickly. How how am I gonna find selling it? Am I gonna have an issue with that? Is it gonna be a whole thing? You know, so if anybody can help me out with uh, with with that, on if I'll have any difficulties or if I need to do anything special um, before selling the vehicle in a different state. Next question, my license, my uh, Alberta license. Will it be good in Australia or will I need to apply for something like an international driver's license? Um, yeah, that, that one's pretty straightforward. How do I get a license? How do I legally drive on the roads? So if you have any tips for me on that, I would really appreciate it. Now, there may be other questions that I don't even know I need to be asking yet. So if you guys have any advice for me on that, I would also appreciate it. Um, you can leave them in the comments below or what would be even better is, you know, reaching out to me via email. Also, I'll just say this right now, we will be selling the vehicle. And so if you're in Perth and you're looking for a four wheel drive vehicle, we'll have one for sale that will be selling at a really good price because I will need to get rid of it relatively quick, quickly when we're done with it so that I can go back home. So if you guys are in the market for a used four wheel drive that just crossed Australia, in, in November, time frame November 2024, uh, reach out, hit me up, and maybe we can make a deal and I can sell you the truck for a good price. 
Yeah, the other thing I wanted to, to talk to you guys about was if any of you guys watch our videos and you live in Australia, we would love to meet up with some people that watch our videos and you know maybe go, go four wheel driving or if you guys wanna come with us on a section of our trip across, across Australia through the bite, um, if you guys have any time, reach out, hit me up because like I said, we, I, have a, I have a basic idea and kind of a general understanding of trails and camping and stuff like that, but um, to have local knowledge is just, um, is just that next step. And I would, I would really love to, to meet some of you guys, chat, ask you guys a bunch of questions, and just have a really good time you know, while we're over there. Part of the reason to go traveling is to meet people, uh, especially if they're into four-wheel drive and camping and, and stuff like that. You know, I think we would get along really well. So I'd love to meet some of you guys. Feel free to reach out. Um, maybe we can, we, we can set something up, uh, meet up for a couple days, a couple weeks, however much time you got, really. <clears throat> yeah, so like I said, if, you, if you're into something like that, we can set something up. This concludes the Australia portion of our video. We'll share more information as it becomes available to us. We hope to see some of you out on the tracks of Australia. Whatever happened to our cross Canada trip? Well, stick around for part two of this video for a short story of epic proportions. Whatever happened to our cross Canada trip? That never happened. And now we're planning this whole other huge Australia trip. And it's because a couple of really bad things happened and I just got very frustrated over the whole thing. And I, I had to take a couple weeks off there and just not even, not even think about really any of this because a couple bad things happened and I will go into that right now. We had a plan 20, summer 2023 of crossing Canada in our troopie because we really want to do some international traveling. But before doing that, uh, we were like, hey, you know what? Canada is a magnificent place. It's one of the biggest countries in the world. It has so much to explore, so much to see. We love everything about it so far. Let's go see more of it, right? Before we, you know, see your own country before venturing out and seeing other countries was kind of our mentality. But like I said, some really bad things happened along the way. Last May, we were trying to go down to the Overland Expo in Flagstaff, Arizona, when we had some injector issues. Here in Canada, it's kind of hard to get an injector for a troopie, like, quickly, and I needed it quickly. So we ended up having to fly down to the Expo, which was fine. I got back from that trip and I replaced the injector on the 1HZ in, in our troopie, and it didn't fix the knock. It, so the engine was knocking. It sounded like, you know, what an engine knock sounds like, right? And, uh, and I thought, you know, it's got to be this injector. And I was just dead set on, you know, it being a fuel knock and injector knock. That was not the case. What was the case was the, actual, the fuel pump had just, was just completely worn out, the injection pump. Being here in Canada, again, uh, that was such a costly repair. I, I don't have the mechanical knowledge to rebuild a pump like that. So I had to take it into a shop. So I took it into a shop here in Calgary and I won't, I won't really name names, but we did not have the best of experiences with that shop because he quoted me like a, a week to get the job done and several thousand dollars, right? Very expensive, but I can get it done for you in a week. And I thought, great, you know, we just got back from Arizona, um, need to get this injector fixed because now we're going to cross Canada. So let's get this ball rolling. Let's get the show on the road sort of thing, right? A month later, I still did not have the vehicle back with the new injection pump in it. It just took them so long to get anything done. And it was just one of those things where I just kept having to nag them and nag them. I would never get an update from these guys at the shop. You know, it's like time's ticking down and we really need to start getting on the road because we had a, you know, we had eight weeks, I think, to cross Canada and back. We had a lot to see and a lot to do on the schedule. We just were running out of time to get this troopy fixed. Finally, we just, we flat out ran out of time. Um, th the fix on the pump was taking so long, it started to eat into our trip and then we were having to reschedule some things. And then I'm like, okay, if we shave this and we shave that and we cancel this and we cancel that, we can still make it, we can still make it. And the plan was to just go and just, just get it done and keep going. Um, and by the time we got the truck back, there was, frankly, there was just no time left. There was no time left to do anything other than sit in the truck and drive on the highway all day. And neither of us wanted to do that. We really wanted to see um, some of the lesser known parts of this country. So we canceled the cross Canada trip. Very frustrating. Plan B, we did have a plan B. 
in case of in case something like this happens, what what are we doing? What's plan B? Well, now instead of eight weeks to do it, we have you know three weeks. That's how much time it it, it this rebuild ate into our trip, right? We had three weeks to do something. So we thought, where else do we want to go? And where else realistically can we go for three weeks? Um, one of the things on our list was Haida Gwaii. Haida Gwaii, British Columbia. It's an archipelago of islands uh, north of Vancouver Island. It's supposed to be a magnificent place in British Columbia. And so that was plan B. That uh, has been on our list for a couple years. So we thought, hey, you know, we got a couple weeks here. We can, we can, you know, scoot on over to Haida Gwaii. It'll be... We'll have a great trip. It'll be great. You know, troopies all fixed, new pump, everything's running great. Woohoo! Let's go, right? Okay, we get in the truck. We're rolling through Golden, BC, and what do you know? The engine in the vehicle starts to knock again. Fuel knock. It, like exactly the same problem, and it was the weirdest problem. I cracked open. This is how I limped at home last time. I had to crack open a nut at the injector. Okay, a fuel line. I, I opened a fuel line at the injector and the knock stopped. It was still running rough, but the, at least it wasn't knocking. So I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, it's knocking clearly at this injector. I can hear it. I crack open the fuel line while the vehicle is running. It's, it's, you know, bubbling and spraying fuel everywhere. It's spraying because it's an open fuel line, but it's not knocking. And then sure enough, I clamp it closed. I, I wrench it closed. And, uh, and it starts to knock again. Knock, 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 knock. Open it. I'm like, okay, well, I have to drive with the fuel line just cracked open just a hair because for some reason this pressure in the fuel line is just making this injector knock. So has it been an injector this entire time? I don't know. I, I still don't know. A year later, I still do not know. I was told that the fuel pump was in really, really rough condition. So it needed a rebuild regardless. But was that my problem from the beginning? I don't know, um, because now I'm having this injector knock. We're halfway to Golden on our way to Haida Gwaii. I limp it down into Golden. I pull over and, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm on the phone with shops. I'm on the phone with guys. You know, I'm on the phone with the guys who rebuilt the pump. I'm on the phone with Devin from Four Wheel Freedom. I'm just on the phone trying to get this thing figured out. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm trying to, and you know, I get people on the phone that I don't know who they are. I'm in, on the phone with tow truck drivers. You know, how long is it gonna take? Do I need to get it towed home? It was not, it was not a fun experience, but it gets worse. I'll tell you this, it gets, it gets 10 times worse than this, guys. I make the executive decision to pull the injector out on the side of the road, okay? I'm in a, I'm in a parking lot. I'm in a gravel, like U-Haul parking lot, or something like that. This was a year ago now, so I have to refresh my memory. I'm in the gravel parking lot of a U-Haul dealership in Golden, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and swap an injector out. We're trying to avoid a tow. I'm gonna give this injector swap a go and uh, we'll see what happens. Let's do it. So I carry a box of spare fuel stuff. It's not the most organized, but I carry a couple of spare injectors. Um, I carry, this is the Terrain Tamer one we've been using. I've heard that they used factory Denso injectors or internals. And then I also have this straight from Toyota, 100% Denso one. So I'm gonna swap in this injector. We'll see what happens. Then get the one injector. the lines off to get the rail off. Here it is. This is the injector we'd like to swap out. Anything obviously wrong? Not that I can see. A little bit of carbon buildup on the top there, but that's normal. Mm -hmm. 
So, I don't know, guys, I don't know. All right, so we just finished installing a new injector. Um, cleaned up a few things, made sure everything was snugged up and where it should be. So now we are going to fire it up. Oh boy. <laughs> Give it a couple pumps. Okay. good actually. Better than it was, right? You know, it's midday, I'm, I'm wrenching on this thing and I pull the injector out. What happens after that? Well, I put and uh, my fresh injector in so I fire up the vehicle and what do you know it sounds halfway decent it sounds all right rev it up it's not knocking what the heck's going on did I fix it what has it been an injector this whole time I don't know but the vehicle's running okay and it sounds good it sounds healthy we pack up and we say okay let's uh, let's take it for a test drive this is where things go really, really bad, very south, very quickly. And this is why you need to have some safety precautions in place because things can get really real, really fast. And it was one of the scariest experiences of my life, okay? So we're on the test drive after replacing an injector, right? You're with me so far. And we're about 10 kilometers outside of Golden on a back road, wa wandering through the mountains, you know, mountain back roads. And all of a sudden we're chugging up this hill and the cab of the Troopy starts to fill with smoke just from one second to the next. You know, one second I'm thinking about the engine and the injector I just replaced. And the next, the cab is literally full of smoke within five seconds. We, like I can't see Allison next to me. So I, I pull over to the side of the road, I stop the vehicle, I shut everything off, I pop the hood, and there's, and there's flames coming out from under the hood between the battery and the fender of the vehicle. I immediately rush to get my fire extinguisher because I carry one um, in the passenger footwell. So I run and I grab this fire extinguisher and I start spraying because I see flames, right? I'm extinguishing, I'm extinguishing. I, I empty my fire extinguisher, I exhaust my fire extinguisher and the flames are still not out, okay? It did not put out the fire. Stick with me here. I have a spare fire extinguisher, a second, number two, in the back of the truck. I go running around, the engine's still on fire. Open the back doors of the Troopy, pull out my spare fire extinguisher, exhaust this thing too. I'm spraying it, I'm spraying it, I, you know, Put the white stuff on the hot stuff, okay? That's basically how it goes. Two fire extinguishers in, this thing is still burning. I'm not even kidding you. Okay, so from that moment, I am down two fire extinguishers um, and I, I have reduced the amount of the fire, but it's still on fire and I know that it will grow again if I do not fully extinguish it, okay? So I look very quickly, what is on fire? What is actually burning? It appeared to be an electrical fire between the battery and the fender. There were wires running in between there and it looks like that was burning, but it was catching a bunch of other stuff on fire too. So I have no more fire suppressant left. Okay, I look around and I think, where am I? Where can I get more fire suppressant? Well, um, on one side of the road, you know, we're pulled over on the side of the road and on, you know, we're parked right next to somebody's uh, farm, like a big acreage, several acres on a farm. And off in the distance, I can see a house where people live, right, on a farm. The only problem is it's, you know, several hundred yards away. So 
I go running across these people's yard, field, farm, okay? I go running across and I start knocking on their door. And we're in the middle of nowhere. We're in the middle of, you know, backwoods BC. There's not a lot of people out there. Um, so I go running across these people's property and I'm, and I'm pounding on their door. Maybe they have another fire extinguisher. That's what was going on in my head, right? Like at this point, I, I, I don't have anything else myself, right? So an old lady answers the door and I'm like, please help, call 911. We have a vehicle fire over on the road and do you have another fire extinguisher? Now I was shouting these words at her because my adrenaline was just going so crazy, right? It's like, how do you explain? We have a vehicle fire. I need you to call the fire department and I need a fire extinguisher right now, right now, right now. <laughs> so she was able to get me another fire extinguisher and, uh, and she said, okay, I'll call, I'll call 911. Here's here. She gave me another one. It was, it was a very small one. You know, I had just doused two, two big fire extinguishers on it. Didn't do it. She gave me a small one. I go running back to the truck. Third one didn't cut it, did not cut the flames. I'm not even kidding you. I go running back and she's out bringing me a pail of water. And I think, oh geez, you know, you're really not supposed to put water on an electrical fire. That's just a kind of a no, no but I have nothing else. So you know what? Water it is. So they had a big 50 gallon drum under a rain spout that was collecting rainwater. And uh, it was just bucket after bucket after bucket after bucket of rainwater from, I emptied probably half of that big drum of water. And it was myself, Allison, the older lady, her husband came out, people on a bike were biking by, they started helping. I'm not even kidding. It was just a train of people bringing bucket after bucket after bucket of water trying to put this uh, this electrical fire out. And finally we got it out. Um, I got the, I finally was able to, when the flames were contained, I was able to disconnect the battery because that's a big one. You need to disconnect the battery because that's what's feeding your electrical fire. Here's the thing, you can't disconnect the battery when everything's on fire, right? <laughs> you need to kind of get it contained, then I was able to disconnect the battery. Then we were able to douse a hell of a lot of water on it and, uh, and get everything under control. Um, so we finally got it out. The troopy was just an absolute mess. There was fire extinguisher powder everywhere in the engine bay. Everything was soaked. It was really bad. I almost watched the whole vehicle go up in flames. I'm sure you guys have seen videos of vehicles burning on the side of the road. Maybe you guys have seen vehicles burning on the side of the road. And I tell you what, I work in emergency services and cars, once they are on fire, they are extremely difficult because everything burns. Fuel burns, plastic burns, rubber burns. Um, metal doesn't burn. Metal's the only thing left, you know, but all the fabrics burn, everything. Cars are just very flammable. Yeah, so they're, it, I, I just didn't, I was beside myself. I mean, I almost watched my vehicle go up in flames, but with the help of some very generous, very kind people, we were able to get that vehicle fire under control relatively quickly. Here's the quick, here's the kicker though. The fire department declined to come help. So I'm on the phone with the 911 operator dousing my vehicle, right? And the 911 operator basically says, sorry, um, you are out of the, district the golden district by like a couple kilometers right because i'm still relatively close to golden and the closest fire department was golden and basically it said sorry you're out of luck you will have she said you'll have to let it burn if it starts to touch the surrounding landscape um, somebody's yard will send somebody but if it's just burning on the road we're not going to send anybody we'll send the police and sure enough 30 minutes later our cmp show up and the fire was out. We're all just standing around, kicking rocks, talking about what happened. Police asked if everybody was okay, and then they took off, right? Fire department never came. You know what? I get it. I, like I said, I do work in emergency services. We work within our jurisdiction, okay? I get it. But when it's your own emergency and it's your own truck that's on fire and somebody says, no, sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's tough, right? It's tough. You know what? I, it didn't actually burn too much. What was really bad was the batteries and in between. So the battery and the fender wall, 
um, all that stuff, all those wires and everything were all singed, but there was no major damage. There was no major damage, thankfully. So what do you do after that? I couldn't, I couldn't drive the vehicle. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, pulled off on the side of the road next to somebody's farm, half charred, half burnt. What do I do with it now, right? I called one of my buddies, big shout out to him. He drove all the way from Calgary to pick Allison and I up and drive us back home. Uh, we left the troopy on the side of the road for three days for a weekend until I had one of my other buddies uh, grab a flat deck and uh, he flat decked the vehicle home for me because getting a tow that far from Calgary, several hundred kilometers plus across BC and Alberta borders, it was, it was <clears throat> you know, it, it was almost damn near impossible and insanely expensive. So I ended up getting the vehicle uh, flat decked he came and he picked it up. He was actually on his way from Vancouver Island. He stopped in Golden on the way back to Calgary, loaded up the uh, the half burnt troopy and, <laughs> and flat decked at home, brought it back to me and unloaded it in my back alley. Sucked it up there. Yeah. So I, I imagine it'll probably be pretty good. Hey everyone. So the last time you saw us, we were in Golden and we had just swapped a fresh injector in. Now, the story gets a little wild from here. So um, we're gonna hop inside quick and I'm gonna tell you the story and then I'll hop back out here because I'm just about to open this up and see what happened. Oh. Still got a little bit of powder from the fire extinguisher here. I don't know, I, I, I really don't know what happened here. We got lots of belted wires. Yeah, gonna have to start ripping into this. Not sure if the batteries are still good or what, but I'm gonna have to start ripping into it and see what, what needs to be done to get it all fixed up again. Guys, that is what happened to our cross Canada trip. That's what happened to our summer last year. That is why we didn't get to do some of the fun things we had planned. But you know what? Um, we ended up having a really good time anyway. My dad lives in Germany, so I went and I visited him uh, for a couple of weeks. We went to Hawaii. I also have family in Hawaii. So you know what? We just took the rest of the summer and, uh, and said, you know what? We're kind of done with, uh, with off-roading, camping, vehicles, troopies, trucks. I'm done with it for a few weeks. I just need to put it away, not think about it, and go do some other things, some other things that are not related to this because it was very upsetting to say the least. You know, not only did our plans get canceled, but then the truck almost burns down. Um, <clears throat> it was bad. It was really bad. And it was kind of tough to move forward from that, right? Um, but we did, so I uh, came back, we came back from Europe. We had a fantastic time in Europe. We did other people things, you know, other people kind of travel differently than we do. They get on a plane, they do a lot of walking around. That's what, that's how other people travel, right? And you know what, we, that's how we did it. That's how we did the rest of our summer. We came back from summer and I said, all right, what am I gonna do with this hunk of steel here, right? Um, it was mainly in one piece, but I really just needed to tear it down and see what was damaged and what I needed to replace. So I pulled it apart and I wanted to see what, what, what happened? What caused this fire? Why did it go up in flames? What is going on? And I came to the conclusion with my expertise in uh, fire investigation that the wiring harness uh, was too close between the battery, so the wall of the battery in the engine bay, and the fender wall, there was a wiring loom was running between that, and it was too close, and the wiring loom was pinched. And every time we hit a bump, the wiring loom would rub, rub, rub on the battery and the fender, rub, 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 rub over corrugations. We rubbed right through that wiring loom, it shorted out on the fender, boom, there's your fire right there. It charred the entire wiring harness. When that harness shorted out, that's what caused all of the smoke in the cab was because the short started in the engine bay, but it basically fried the entire wiring harness. So the wiring harness goes from your engine bay. It's like a big horseshoe. Okay. So it starts in one side of your engine bay 
and it goes, it, it runs like basically from your battery through the firewall of the vehicle, go figure, you know, the fire got through the firewall, right? Mm, who would have thought? Uh, in, in behind your dashboard, it runs across your dashboard, but behind, and then back into the engine bay on the other side. So kind of does this big horseshoe thing, at least in, in our vehicle, that's how it works. The smoke we were seeing in the cab was the wiring harness burning behind the dashboard. So basically what I had to do to fix this, we had to take the entire dashboard out of the Troopy, which thank God that this thing is a simple vehicle. It's basically a tractor. The nuts and bolts, the dash was quite easy to pull out because if it had been a newer vehicle, uh, pff, good luck. I would not have been able to do that. Um, but being that the Troopy is so um, simple to work on and so there's just really nothing to it, but uh, you know, you can work a screwdriver, you can basically work on anything in a Troopy. I, I had to pull out the entire wiring harness. It, it also burnt our fan blower motor box. That's really all it damaged. Other than that, uh, the remaining dashboard components were in good shape. I gave everything a really good cleaning, a really good check over. I ordered parts. I had. To, I found a complete wiring harness. Complete. I can't even tell you guys how lucky I am. And I didn't even find it. Uh, James from Australia. He's the one who helped me import it. Uh, he found me a complete wiring harness for a Troopy that was in really, really good shape. And I, I ordered that. It, you know, it actually wasn't too expensive, all things considered. So I ripped the old harness out, which was a lot of work still put the new harness in, replaced a couple of dashboard pieces, got the dashboard in. It took me a couple of weeks. Um, the guys at Four Wheel Freedom at the shop, again, shout out to Devin and the guys at Four Wheel Freedom because they really, you know, I can, I did a lot of it by myself, but they helped me with a lot of it as well. Um, helped me kind of diagnose some things along the way and ultimately get me back on the road. They let me keep the vehicle in their lot um, while I was working on it. So I basically had it at the shop at Four Wheel Freedom, ripped it all apart, put it all back together, had them diagnose some things for me, get the vehicle started. And, uh, and then it was back on the road with a new harness, some new dashboard pieces, um, some new batteries, and a big, big, big lesson learned on how to root wiring and not to pinch it because it was my fault this whole time. It was my fault. Um, when I replaced the batteries and I installed the dual battery system, that is how I ran the wiring loom. And I ran it too tight between the fender and the battery. And it, basically it was my mistake that caused this huge, huge, huge issue. So I can't tell you guys how big of a screw up that was for me. That was probably my ultimate screw up in my whole life. That was the biggest screw up. Thankfully, nobody was injured. I did not lose the vehicle. Everything on the vehicle was repairable. Um, the vehicle runs perfectly now. It actually, with the new wiring harness, it's, it runs better than it's ever run before, you know? So maybe a blessing in disguise, a big, big, big lesson learned. But that is ultimately the story about what happened to our Cross Canada trip, what happened to our summer, why we didn't go to Haida Gwaii either. So I just wanted to incorporate it in this story about how we're going to Australia because we're really gonna do our best here, um, but sometimes there just are unforeseen circumstances that you cannot predict, right? I didn't know that I, <laughs> that any of this stuff was going to happen with, with the vehicle almost burning down, right? I just could not predict that. So I wanted to tell you guys that, that story and we're back at it, we're persevering, we're back on to bigger and better. The Troopy's fixed, we're keeping the Troopy at home. We're going to Australia, I'm going to do my best to buy a vehicle, going to try to cross the continent, get Allison finished up with her schooling, and then ultimately fly home. We wanna do some big things here, guys. Sometimes bad things happen, but you really just need to persevere and you need to keep going. If you guys want something, I know, I know what I want. It's not gonna take a troopy burning down to stop me. I'm gonna keep going because I know what I want. So it's a bit of a story in perseverance. I'm not saying that we're going to be successful on this Australia trip. It could all go to hell in a handbasket really quickly because um, now I know how bad things can go very quickly. So we're gonna do our best, we're gonna try, and I hope you guys follow along with us for the journey. We're gonna make a lot of videos. We're, I'm hoping to do weekly videos, if not bi-weekly videos on our experience through Australia, purchasing the vehicle, how it all goes, 
what we're going to be outfitting the vehicle with, camping equipment. Um, it's going to be a budget build. That's the other thing, you know, um, a budget truck, a budget build. It's going to be a lot of fun because I find budget builds are a lot of fun. You know, if you have a bunch of money and you could just buy the fanciest stuff, that's great. And that's a lot of fun. But I, what I really think is cool are the guys who do this stuff on a budget because you have to be resourceful. You have to be smart about it to, to accomplish your goal. And it can ultimately turn into a really good story. So like I said, we're going to be producing a lot of content. We're going to be filming everything. And I hope you guys stick around to watch some of the madness unfold while we try to cross Australia. Guys, thanks again for watching and we will see you soon.